Hello, everybody. I'm Everton de Oliveira, and I'm from the Groundwater Project. And we're happy to bring to you today uh, another new book, a great book. And we have the author here to answer some questions to us about his interesting book you would like to know. Please go to our website, Groundwater Project website here. You see, you see the, the URL here. And download the book. It's all for free and it's very good. Can't be better than that, right? Free book, free good books, please go there. Don't waste your time, all right? Today we have here uh, JP Brandenburg. Uh, he's a geologist that likes math. Wow, that's, that's quite unusual. <laughs> or for me, at my, when I was a geologist, that was quite unusual. I think today that's not as unusual as it was. He's a groundwater modeler for Halley and Aldrich. He started modeling geodynamics at the University of Michigan and joined Shell, where he developed studies in geodynamics, petroleum geology, structural geology, and modeling. Well, welcome, JP. Should I call you JP? I'm not going to yes, call please. you. Yes, <laughs> please. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, tell us a bit about your career, how you became involved with groundwater and why collaborating with Groundwater Project, and how you became a hydrogeologist before anything. Sure. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's like you, you noted in the introduction there, um, I started doing modeling when I was a student at University of Michigan. I did my uh, uh, PhD thesis on um, viscous convection in the Earth's mantle. So that's um, overturn that takes place over billions of years. And so it was um, fluid flow for something that's basically a solid. Uh, so it was very computationally intensive finite element modeling. And you know, it was, it was a, a good, good experience to really get me up to speed with doing some very rigorous uh, numerical models. Um, kind of decided that wasn't for me uh, going forward. And I was recruited by Shell um, to go work in their research laboratory. And I actually did that in a couple of internships when I was still in graduate school. And I actually got, it, got started there by doing numerical models of um, offshore turbidity currents, some of which um, were um, Brazilian studies. And so we did some numerical modeling with that. Then I actually got hired full-time into their structural geology research organization. So I had to switch gears with the modeling again and do structural geology modeling, which is much more about uh, geometries and deformation, a lot less about the physics. Um, so I did that for a while, and then I moved into offshore um, oil and gas exploration, working in um, primarily in the Gulf of Mexico, but also helping out with some structural geology problems in places like Brazil and uh, Nigeria, Malaysia. I did that for a couple of years, and decided I really missed the modeling. Um, okay. And the environmental industry um, appealed to me for a variety of reasons. So I went and did another um, master's degree from Johns Hopkins in environmental engineering and science. And I went from there, I was hired by Arcadis, and I did some very um, nuts and bolts consulting uh, for a few years, um, working with regulators and actually you know working in the field a bit um and then i met up with murray einerson at haley and aldrich and he said well you've got this background in modeling why don't you come uh, join us and put that to work doing some groundwater flow models and so i went to haley aldrich and i've been there ever since oh that's that's very nice that's very nice uh so so you uh, and then uh, you didn't have a background on, on groundwater modeling then you started when you went to 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 Haley Andrews, yes? Well, I started when I was the, a student at Johns Hopkins, oh, okay. Oh, and, okay. Then, okay. and then and uh, then kind of took off from there uh, at Haley Aldrich, and I think it's um where that's worked out well for me is that I have a background in such a variety of different models. Yes. Um, I I really know what it takes to turn the geology that you observe into some numbers and actually make a model out of it. Yeah. Well, this is this is this is quite interesting for me. Well, and how how and why collaborating with a groundwater project? How did you end up 
uh, with us? Well, I had um, a meeting with uh, Murray when I was still working in Oakland and John Cherry was visiting. And okay. Murray said, well, hey, JP, why don't you come get together with us and chat? And it turned out um, we had a lot of overlapping uh, interests and John Cherry and I knew some of the same people from work he had done with structural geologists. And so we, we got to talking and you know, had a very good meeting with each other. And uh, then he was kind enough to invite me to participate in the project to take some of my experience and turn it into a chapter in the ebook. Thank you, thank you. That's very nice. Well, it's it's hard to. John is very convincing. I know. I, I'm working with him as well. He's, <laughs> he's good at it, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> hard to say no to 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 him. Yeah. Well, well but uh, I'm having fun, which is good, and I, and I hope you 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 have too. No, I was going to say it was. I'm. I was very fortunate and thankful to be invited, and it, it's been a great experience. Thank you. So you're a mathematical modeler, and you started uh, your book talking about pencil and paper. Why is mm -hmm. that? Well, um, people have been interested in these problems um, for way longer than there's been numerical models. And the part where it um, gets into interpreting geology in a way that's like numerically consistent um, goes back to, gosh, the early 1900s. And you know, that was an important thing in the oil and gas world because you want to know when you have any kind of little subtle geologic features that can cause oil and gas to accumulate, um, you have to have mapped them and interpreted them very carefully. And so there's a whole variety of graphical techniques that are done with, you know, old fashioned drafting tables and rulers and parallel dividers and contour maps and the thing that really impressed me is I did a project when I was still working at Shell um, in collaboration with some students at uh, University of Stavanger in Norway. We took some very old interpretations that were done like that of these very complex folded and faulted structures in Southern California. And we had their students digitize them and turn them into a numerical model. And they fit together like a hand in a glove. All of these hundreds of faults and complicated folds. And when you made it, if you did it carefully, you took all that careful work that was done by hand, it just fit together perfectly. So much better than anything you would have done if you had just started on the computer and started clicking buttons. So I think there is still a lot of life left in that uh, type of approach. And you don't need anything special. Um, you can do that sitting at your desk with the, a candlelight with um, pencil and paper, or you can do it on a the ruler. beach with a, with a stick in the sand, you know, <laughs> you, can get a, you can make a lot of progress before you even touch the computer. And I think mm -hmm. that's um, extremely valuable and a great, uh, a good best practice for how to start any modeling project where the geology has any kind of complexity to it at all. Yeah, I just, I just love that, that, the, the introduction because uh, when I, you know, I was teaching students, and I'm always having the same problems. Come on, you do it by hand first, because then you do think about the geology and what is in there before you jump into to <laughs> exactly. any numerical modeling. Because otherwise, you don't even know what's coming out of, of, the, of the model, right? And, mm -hmm. and you may think it's right, but it's, it has no interpretation. You know, no, no, like human interpretation is very important on, on, on that aspect. That's right. Right? Yeah, and especially um, working in uh, some of the petroleum uh, production and exploration projects I worked in, everything is very, very focused on the latest and greatest three-dimensional um, cutting edge, expensive software. And when students um, start as new hires right out of school or even the more experienced hands, they go right into these programs and they start you know, clicking the buttons and filling in the fields, whatever it is they have to do. And because you haven't really thought through what it is you're trying to accomplish in your head yet, you end up with all these kinds of beautiful MC Escher geometries that, you know, they're very visually appealing, but they you know, are a very extent. long way from reality. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, the, the, the typical, the typical uh, uh, entry level, I think, is, uh, is the surfer, right? The surfer software, people, people can do contour uh, mm -hmm. lines with that. The very is you know the colorful and they look beautiful. It doesn't make sense at all, right? Because you yeah. have 
-hmm. you, you don't have an information on the on you know on the edges you just have a few uh wells here and there right mm -hmm. so do do it by hand first you, you show on your book like you, you you can digitize some of the of the contours before you you go to the the model that's that was, that was very nice i like it a lot yeah you know it's it's right and that's to make the point that those exercises are, are still time well spent um you can be doing something that's going to become an integral part of your model. So you're not just, you know, waving your arms, you're actually producing yeah. something that's going to become part of the product that you're delivering in the end. Yep, that's true, that's true. So you, you mentioned uh, that the, something that was quite in interesting for me because I have some, I have some work as well on oil industry. And, and, and you have some terminology that you brought, brought in from the, the oil industry into hydrogeology that is mm -hmm. uh, usually I would say they're, they're not so usual for hydrogeologists. They're, they're, they make good sense, but it's good to, to, to have this fresh uh, names and, and, and way to put the knowledge that we already, ha already have. So you, you use uh, static and dynamic models. What are they? What are they? Okay. Well, they're, they're sort of two faces of the same coin. Um, and a lot of what that terminology has to do from is getting engineers and geologists to talk to each other and <laughs> work on the same project. But it is, it is a logical way to divide these things up. Yeah. Right? So you have typically um, very experienced, very perceptive geologists who are great at you know, figuring out what, what the rocks look like, uh, what are the important properties of the rocks, uh, geometries, faults, folds, anything like that. Um, but they're not necessarily as well educated on how petroleum moves through those same rocks. Yep. And that's a much more complicated, um, mathematically intensive, numerically intensive uh, skill set that reservoir engineers tend to be trained on without having a lot of background on geology, right? So, but that it also is a convenient place to divide the problem in half. So the static model is the part of the problem that the geologist kind of takes charge of. And these are the things that won't change as you extract or as fluids flow through the rocks or as petroleum is extracted. And so those are things like um, how much sand is there? How porous are the rocks? What is the permeability? How are the you know, different rock facies distributed? Um, the whole, that's really the framework for what you're doing. Uh, that gets done, and then that's typically passed over whole cloth to the reservoir engineers to do a simulation. And so that's the dynamic model, and that's everything to do with fluid flowing through that um, nice piece of work that the geologists put together, the static part that it, it does not change. Um, there's also calculations that are called statics that are done to estimate the volume of petroleum you'd have in a reservoir. And so you, take, you can, without even involving the dynamic model, you can take these, a, a well-constructed static model and make some estimates about um, how much oil is there or gas and how much of it is actually extractable. And that's important because that's used to book reserves. And so that's really the, it's a very formalized process. And uh, so there's a lot of demand for people who can, can do that well. Uh, and I, I think that is going to be a big contribution to the environmental community, too, because there's a lot of interest now in flux-based metrics, which depend on answering that question. How much contamination is there? How much of it can you actually move? So that would be almost purely a static modeling exercise without requiring any kind of dynamic models. Yeah, that's true. And not, not only that, because in the environmental uh, world now, we'll have uh, CO2 storage as well. So that's, mm -hmm. that's, uh, uh, that's an important tool because we'll have to develop the static model uh, very well before we start doing anything, right? It's the mm -hmm. same thing, right? And we might have, actually... we'll also have interactions with the water. So this is a, 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 an interesting hydrogeology, hydrogeologic problem for us. And I actually was involved with a project to, to build a static model to study um, natural occurrences of carbon dioxide in groundwater to make some, gain, gain some understanding about how faults behave in the case of 
trying to repurpose old uh, petroleum hydrocarbon traps to be CO2 storage containers. And that was published in um, the American Association of Petroleum Geologists Bulletin, uh, I think in 2012. So um, yeah, it's out there. If you search on my name in Google Scholar, you'll find that article. That's interesting. So your, your, your book is all, is all about um, geologic framework. And uh, as hydrogeologists, uh, as time goes by, we think that we, we're not geologists anymore, right? Because you we do. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, and I had a great fun seeing all the, the geology, you know, the, the, the geologic terms that you use. It's very, very interesting that, that, that and, and this is a joke, of course, because we you use geology a, a lot in our field. <laughs> right. So the question is, okay, it's a, well, it's a, it's a joke. Or I would call a, 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 an insider joke, but like for geologists, that. But could an engineer survive the reading of your book? What do you think? Oh, an inquisitive engineer certainly could. <laughs> <laughs> I've I've worked with uh, um, a number of engineers and throughout my career now, and there is a pretty good set of um, engineering engineers with a certain type of background who are very intrigued by the geology and they may not have the patience or the remit to work through it themselves but um, they can be very very interested in a read like this and I think it's at a good level that um, someone with a little bit of background in geology should be able to jump right in and and learn a few things yeah I agree too I agree too so this is this is a, 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 this question is is just a, just a teaser because I think uh, engineers w wouldn't have a great time. It's it's a it's a very readable book for engineers. I'm pretty sure because I have lots of engineer students, and I'm I'm sure it'll it'll be a success among engineers as well. So it's a welcome book. You mentioned in strat stratigraphy. You mentioned that usually uh, the dimensions of the site and and our lack of funding makes impossible. You know, makes it impossible to be described. How do we get around this so common problem when we want to build a model? Certainly. Uh, I think the first thing to do is to um, embrace the right uh, philosophy about what it is you're trying to accomplish with your model. And I think that's probably the first question that you should ask. Um, and it's you know, a good place for a pencil and paper exercise, which is your model should be as complicated as you need it to be to answer the question you want to answer and not one bit more. So the first thing to figure out is what, what is the minimum level of detail that needs to go into your model to be able to answer questions with it and not just have it be um, you know, a beautiful thing that someone can appreciate <laughs> aesthetically. Uh, and you may discover that you don't even need a um, mod flow model and you know pencil and paper calculation may be fine then you know you you make things progressively more complicated until you get to that point and hopefully you've still got some budget left at that point um now this is where things are getting to be a bit interesting in contaminant hydrogeology because most of the sites that are out there are getting very mature at, at least in north america yeah in north and america. So you, a, a typical chlorinated solvent site would have been discovered in, I don't know, 19, late 1980s. There would have been a whole epic of remediation uh, that went on for 10, 15 years of aggressive pump and treat and dual phase extraction and, and any number of remedial technologies. And it would have been looked at more than likely as a tank of sand or some very simplified geology. And we've reached completely past the point of diminishing returns on those sites now. And we're dealing with the recalcitrant uh, yep. contaminants that are left. So any, any little pocket of fluorinated solvent that won't move, uh, it's hung up in some finer grain sediments or things that were not characterized in 1992. And at the same time, regulatory criteria are getting stricter, especially for things like vapor intrusion. So the details of the modeling start to become uh, very important. And so there's a, there's a whole um, sub-industry now around uh, high, high resolution site profiling, which yeah. generates quite a lot of data. 
And that, that gets interesting because it's almost too much for building a groundwater model. And you have to have a, a systematic way to take that um, very dense data set and turn it into something that you can actually flow water through. And that's where um, some of these techniques like upscaling come into play because you need to define what is the minimum amount of resolution I need to yep. answer these questions and then how do I paint properties into those blocks by you know with the model that's probably a hundred times better resolved than my yeah. or data that's a hundred times better resolved than my model will ever be model, yes <laughs> interesting so uh, that yeah th this is this is an important point um, but but you know those old sites we, we may we have that but usually in a, in a newer site when you when you, when you jump in you rarely have this this huge amount of data. I, I know for, for, for passionate people like you or myself as well, um, it's very fun when you have a, lo a lot of data, then you can you know, play around and rethink the whole model and, and work around and see what you can do with all this data. It's, it's quite interesting. It's, it's good projects to be involved with, I think. So in your book, you mentioned faces, faces upscale and uh, lithologic data to build a model, right? Mm -hmm. Could you give us a flavor? What are they? Okay, and sure. are any of them preferable compared to the others? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I'll um, I'll start with faces because that's one of the oldest um, ways to populate these models, and the idea is you say, well, if I want to know, you know that. The real geology is unknowably complex. Um, you can, I mean, maybe if you sat there with a, I don't know, a, a shovel and cut an outcrop apart one into the other, you could figure out all the complexities. But you, you know, you never will in your model. And the the sort of easiest thing to do is to say, well, okay, when I had similar um, sediments or rocks or things that are bound together by a common set of process, which processes, which would be a facies. Right, so like a um, uh, dune sand would be a facies, right? I can say, well, um, similar dune sands had the following properties when they were measured here or in an analogous site. And you can take that and make sure your facies map matches up with your wells. And then you kind of, you, you basically have to paint in all the white space with um, what you expect the geology to be. Right, so if you see sand, dune sand in one well, dune sand in another, you can fill in the space in between with dune sands and assign um, properties typical of dune sands to that right. interval. That's, that's really all that is. Um, the downside to that is you're really having to use your intuition a lot to where you assign your facies. So, you typically, you know, what, what you're seeing with your wells, even if they're very closely spaced, is just a small, small fraction. And so you need of, of the reality and you have to start to rely on your intuition and um, experience to know how these spaces are distributed in outcrops, for example, or other situations where there's many, many wells. And this is where this um, environmental sequence stratigraphy, which is a yeah. new, um, a, emerging science, again, with its roots in the petroleum industry. Uh, that's where that, that comes into play. Um, now, upscaling data is you say, well, all right, put that aside for a minute. I'm going to start with my core. You know, if you are fortunate enough to have a core or a high resolution log, you might have something that's on the scale of inches. Um, your grid blocks are, in your model are very unlikely to be on the scale of inches. And even if you they were, you'd have a lot of blank ones to fill in, right? So you can take your detailed log and there is a systematic way to figure out, well, if this represented one block in my grid, what would that block look like? And that's what the process of upscaling is. And you can also, if you have someone who's very a meticulous geologic modeler and they produce for you a three-dimensional model that's at a much, much too fine a scale for what you need to simulate, you can use the same techniques. And I have some of these um, laid out in the book, um, but it, it, what it really comes down to is taking all those properties you may have measured and averaging them in ways, 
in different directions and in different ways that gets you to the aggregate flow properties um, you're looking at. And I think that lithological data in this sense would be things like um, well logs. It could also be um, subsamples of your core that you use to measure hydraulic conductivity, any of the hard data that you would use in that upscaling process. Okay. So uh, are any of them preferable to uh, compared to the others? So what, what do you think? Or just all three of... used together. Yeah. So they're not they're not mutually exclusive. Yeah. So typically you want to borrow the best of all three techniques. Yeah. So uh, I think upscale. If if you get too too uh, too much detail or from from upscale, it can be numerically you know competi computationally intensive, right? Mm -hmm. For for your model, what do you think? What do you experience? Or it doesn't matter if you ever oh, it, you know, but mm -hmm. right. Well, I mean, it, if you take it too far, yeah. you average everything together and come up with one hydraulic conductivity, which is not going to be the case. Um, yeah. If you try to slice things too finely, um, your model will become more realistic, certainly, in, in small places where you have data. And mm -hmm. what happens is, as you make the model um, more and more refined, trying to capture more and more detail, you add more and more and more uncertainty. And so at some point, you're making up far more uh, geology than you're observing. And the question is, well, this model is maybe very um, precise for this uh, particular type of deposit, but it completely is lacking in accuracy based on the, your specific yeah. situation. Yeah, good point. Yep, that's true. So that's quite quite, quite interesting. So uh, from your experience, could you tell uh, could you tell us some important examples where the uh, interpretation of the geologic framework was the key to success? I understand this is always the case, I think, or most of the cases. But good examples, you know, can pass the message to, to people very well. Do you have some examples for us, please? Oh, certainly. Um, well, in, I'll start with the oil and gas industry. Um, please. This, a lot of the concepts of building geologic frameworks comes from oil and gas exploration. And in particular, you're trying to look for very subtle features that you might not be able to observe directly that are things that lead to um, accumulations of oil and gas. And if it's not done carefully and you get it wrong, um, that can often be the cause of a dry hole being drilled. So you'd say, aha, well, I have reason to expect that there is oil and gas in this location. Um, but it turned out the geologic framework wasn't careful and your faults don't seal or instead of having something bowl shaped, it's more like saddle shaped and everything would have spilled out over time. So there's countless, countless examples of that in the oil and gas world, um, both in terms of successes and failures. For the environmental industry, um, it's hard to get into specifics too much because a lot of um, cases where things could be demonstrated to be a smash success are also being litigated. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> but I, I have seen some examples of where very careful um, this process of framework building uh, led to some insights about the geology that proved to be very um, insightful where there was contaminants that had spread in a way that you wouldn't have guessed if it was just a tank of sand or something very uniform. And they, these things led to um, settlements in the, the favor of the people who were paying for the geologic framework development. Um, but scientifically, you know, that's, that's great because you answered a question, right? And yeah. the, a lot of the arguments in um, contaminant hydrogeology tend to be very speculative. So whenever I see that happen, it's, Great, it's a win, a win for science and a win for everybody. <laughs> yes, you, 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 you are right. Well, usually, usually it's uh, well, what I tend to see in most works are the, a complete uh, disregard for the geologic framework, right? Well, it's okay mm -hmm. if, if you're working in a very shallow area where you may have influence of the structures and, and you know, uh, man-made uh, 
you know, things that are there. But when you go a little bit deeper and you get a, a way of the, all these interferences, ge uh, geology is, is the main uh, actor for anything for us, right? And yeah. It's, uh, and it's, uh, in, some time, uh, in some places, it's just uh, people just try to disregard and think as everything as a sandbox or the average things here and there. Or modelers tend to add a, a different hydraulic conductivity just to match the, you know, the water level here and there. You know, <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. it's a way to to play around the model to get, you know, first draw the curve, then, you know, plot the data. That's the the idea, right? Mm -hmm. But the geolo geology used to uh, uh, help us think properly. That's what I understand from your book, correct? Yes. And, and to get back to what you were asking about facies and um, static modeling, uh, I have definitely seen a cognitive bias towards facies that tend to be very sandy and uniform. Um, so <laughs> everybody wants their thing to be uh, something that is effectively a sheet sand or a tank of sand. And then they find out that that was... Uh, not in their favor to go in that direction initially, but everyone's, you're always hoping, you're always hoping you're gonna, you know, be in that one geologic setting where very often things are just sand and there's no heterogeneity and great, your life is easy. <laughs> oh, it's like, well, but then, then, then we have the Sudiki's uh, pa uh, paper when he showed the, the hydraulic conductivity differences, you know, and, and in fine detail for every 10 centimeters, you have a, one to two order of magnitude differences between hydraulic conductivity. So there's no such a thing as a as a homogeneous sand, right? When you think on on mm -hmm. hydrogeology, that's a, a, an interesting point. Right? right, and it's all a all a question of scale too. Um, you can have yeah. you can have um, you know like millimeter scale heterogeneity in terms of hydraulic conductivity, and still have something on the whole that um, behaves heter or homogeneously or yep. quite the opposite and it can be they can be very subtle effects too and that is one of the um, research topics i'm i'm very interested in right now is to you know say okay based on the stratigraphy based on the geology based on lots of analogs um what what situation do we expect ourselves to be in here and how is that going to affect the if it's a um, contaminant hydrogeology problem. How is that going to affect the design of our remedy? Uh, yep. How does that drive any kind of modeling we do? And yeah, I, I find it a very interesting topic. Well, I think your book is going to be a success because it's very practical. It's easy, easy to read, easy to practice the, the exercise. I try the, uh, some of them. And those are the, the exercises uh, I love to, to, to have my students practicing because they do see the results. So I, I think it's uh, a great contribution to, to the groundwater project. And I hope for the hydrogeology community and water uh, uh, throughout the world. Let's see if we can have people translating your book to, to have a huge reach for it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we have here JP Brandenburg. Uh, he prepared this book for you. Go to our website, please. JP, could you please give us your final remarks? It was very nice having you. Thank you very much for your contribution. We'll try to boost your book because it's very good. And it's, as I mentioned, it's a good book for free. Can't miss it. So just have it. If you even want to take a look, it's free. So just grab it and, and, and see if you look it, okay? And send your mm -hmm. comments. Please, your final remarks, JP. Yes. I would encourage the most hardened of numerical modelers uh, to see how much of this you can accomplish with pencil and paper. And I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. <laughs> I do too. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, JP. It was okay. nice to have you around here. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you too. <laughs> bye, bye. Bye.